Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's good to be here. It's been a few years since I was here. I look back, I think it was like four or five years is the last time I was here representing Lutheran Family Service. It's really good to be back again with you. I'm here today to thank you for the work and the, the support that you have given to us. The prayer support, the financial support, any type of support, using our services, however you've, you have supported us, thank you for that. Uh, thank you because we are your ministry of, of counseling and adoption and life advocacy and workshops that we present throughout the state. We do this for you and on behalf of you. We aren't owned by the district. Actually, we're owned by you. All of the uh, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod congregations in Iowa. So thank you. Thank you for your support. It's really good to be with you uh, here today. I find it you know, really interesting what the gospel lesson or the Old Testament lesson Ted said today where Isaiah wrote, uh, shall the potter be regarded as the clay and the things that made say to its maker, he didn't make me or the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding. You know, I read that. I thought, boy, how true that is of people, many people in the world today, isn't it? I mean, they think they're God not God, you know, uh, not acknowledging the creator, but the creature thinking that they are the creator. But then did you hear what Isaiah said as you continued to read on in the Old Testament lesson? Listen, I'll read it again. He, he said here, in that day, okay, this is going to happen, but in that day, the deaf will hear the words of a book. And out of their gloom and darkness, the blind will see. That's what's going to happen. That's the promises that God gives to us. The word of the book. It's got to be the Bible, doesn't it? And that's where people are going to see what they hadn't seen before. Good news. People may have things turned upside down, as Isaiah said. But we want to make sure we've always got that rock and that foundation that we're standing on in our life, don't we? So... I'm going to tell you a story. The story I tell is going to be my story, but I don't, I don't want you to think about my story. I want you to think about your story because your story is very similar to my story. And I can't use all of your names and dates, so I'll just use mine, okay? For me, my story started 71 years ago. And 71 years ago... This is what I looked like. All right, here we go. You tell me, this is 71 years ago. What is this? Did you hear that? She said, it's a baby. I find it really incredible. This is a model of a 10 week old baby still in the mother's womb. Here we go, we got some children here. I'm sure you wanna see this. This is what it looks like 10 weeks old when you're in your mother's womb. Now, a little child looked at this and correctly identified it for what it really is. It's a baby because you, you can see eyes and nose. You see the arms and the legs, you know, everything that's there. This is not just tissue. And yet some people would say that's all it is, is tissue. Have I changed any? No, a little bit, haven't I? All right. Ten weeks old. At 10 weeks of age here, it was not my mother's heart beating blood through this. It was my heart that was doing it. And the blood that was going through me at my time, my mom and I have different blood types. It wasn't my mom's blood going through. It was me. My DNA is different from my mother's. And a very incredible thing was happening to me at this time, at this really young, tender age. And the psalmist says it. When the psalmist says, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Already at this young age, it wasn't just body parts growing. It wasn't just tissue growing. It was God at work knitting me together in my mother's womb. An incredible thing was happening at that time. Yeah. And then on February 25th, of 1951, 
is the day that I open my eyes to this wonderful world and creation that God has made. It was my birthday. And I opened my eyes to this world and all of the things that God had made in creation. Yes, it's not perfect as it once was in the Garden of Eden, but still so many remnants of that are still here for us to have and to enjoy as God made it for us. The sights and the sounds and the smells and the tastes and the excitement of living on this earth and in this world that God made for us. I opened my eyes to that and my mother held me. But they knew on that day, even on that day, that something else was needed for me. That even though God had been busy knitting me together in my mother's womb, as the Bible said, still, I was a sinner. Because the Bible says there's not a just man on earth that doeth good and sinneth not. And the wages of sin is death. And that included for me. You know, the Bible says that, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So that while even though God was at work knitting me together, that sin that we call original sin still was passed down even to me. And so on March 25th of 1951, my parents brought me here to the baptism font and the waters of holy baptism. And on that day, my my father, who was a pastor, poured water on my head. And he said, Michael Craig Wolfram, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all of the people in that church in Larchwood, Iowa that day saw what happened. But what was really important is not what they saw, but what they didn't see. Because on that day and at that moment, God worked through that water and that word. And he made me his child. So although my parents brought me down the church aisle that day, their child, when they carried me out, they knew something that's very special had happened. And I was a child of God. Well, they knew that I was just a typical boy and I really was. Uh, they moved to Mallard, Iowa then. My dad accepted a call to Trinity Lutheran Church, and so that's where I grew up. And week after week, they brought me right here, because they knew that Sunday after Sunday, I would hear an Old Testament lesson, and an epistle lesson, and a gospel lesson. And they knew that these were not just stories made up by the ancients to try to explain a religion or religious practices. They knew that these were not just wise sayings of how to live that some scribes had written centuries ago, millennia ago. But they knew that this was the very word of God, the inspired and the inerrant word of God. And if you ever go to the Ark Encounter or to the Creation Museum, I went there a couple of years ago and I heard Ken Ham speak. And I thought Ken Ham had one insightful statement. Well, he had many, but one particular hit me was this. He said this, don't call them Bible stories. Because people today, when they hear story, think of some made up yarn, you know, that uh, storyline that people have. He said, call them what they are, the biblical account the the historical record the word of god don't just call them stories because my parents brought me here knowing that they knew that that faith that god created in me on that day march 25th 1951 was going to need to be nurtured and supported and they knew that it would grow as the Spirit worked through the Word of God. And oh man, what years those were. I mean, people just like you, my Sunday school teachers, my vacation Bible school teachers, you know, the youth choir leaders, all of the good people at Trinity Lutheran Church, just like you people, you were my teachers. You were the one who taught that Word and helped it grow in me until my life was about to change. And that happened in the fall of 1961. See, in the fall of 1961, I had to give up Saturday morning cartoons. 
that I watched every Saturday morning. Every, every young boy and girl, in, in, as soon as you got into fifth grade in Mallard, Iowa, in those days, on Saturday morning, had to go to confirmation classes. And confirmation classes lasted all morning. So fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, all of us were in our churches for confirmation classes. And in those confirmation classes in fifth and sixth grade, we studied more about those biblical records. The account, the historical account, the Word of God, the Old Testament lessons, and the New Testament lessons. And then in 7th and 8th grade, we started to really get deeper into the catechism and how the Lutheran uh, teachings of the Lutheran Church are in conformity with what the Bible says. And we learn Bible verses and hymn verses and we memorize the catechism until April 25th of 1965. And I walked down that aisle, and having heard and studied the Word of God, I was ready on that day to profess for myself publicly the faith that my parents spoke on my behalf on the day that I was baptized. And I walked forward after professing that faith in front of the whole congregation, and I knelt at the communion rail. And my father put his hand on me, and he gave me a blessing. And after he gave me a blessing, he gave me a Bible verse. And that Bible verse, my confirmation verse, was Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And on that day, I was able to do something I had never done before in my life. I'd heard about it. I had seen it, I was a little inquisitive about it, but I was never able to do it until after that day. And on that day, I was able for the first time in my life at the age of 14 to come and receive the sacrament of the altar. And I knew that as I put my hand forth that day and my father placed a wafer in my hand, that I was not just putting a wafer in my mouth, but in, with, and under that bread was the very body of Christ given into death for my sins. And in, with, and under that wine was the very blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of my sins. And I knew that this was a very, very special meal. Growing up in Mallard, Iowa in the 50s and 60s was really quite an experience. I mean, in the 50s, you, you've seen the shows, the Leave it to Beaver, the Father Knows Best, you know, those shows. Those weren't TV shows for us. That was life for us. Oh, how I remember, you know, going out, getting pickup baseball games in the park and in and, and, driveways, playing basketball, playing kick the can at night and, and hide and go seek. Uh, so many fun things that we did in those days and rock and roll music emerging and fun. I'm riding my bicycle, you know, all over town, small town that we lived in, how much fun that was. And then putting baseball cards that I wish I had now kept in the spokes, making my bicycle into a motorcycle. Wow, what days those were. But then came the 60s. And with the 60s for me came adolescence. And those were tough days. Because in those days, we saw in our country very difficult and trying times. Assassinations of major leaders in our country. We were also saw rioting in Watts, Chicago, Memphis. And those of you can remember back to those days, Wow, the racism that was prominent and, and, and the segregation and desegregation issues that we had to deal with. And police, remember the derogatory terms that we had for police? And who can forget, don't trust anybody over the age of, those of you who are alive, remember that, 30. Those are tough days. The emergence of, of the hippie movement and the drug culture and, and the free sex culture. All oh, those are difficult days. A lot of turmoil in our land. And those are the days that I was an adolescent. And I gotta tell you something. In those days, there were times 
And I dropped that rock. But I also knew that I could come and I could receive the forgiveness of sins and receive that sacrament of the altar even for the sins of my youth. It's about that time I started dating a, a young girl. I was a senior in high school at the time, and we dated through our senior year of high school and <coughs> continued on through college. And on August 4th of 1973, 48 years ago, she would be with me today, but she's working part-time at Camp Okoboji. Uh, I, my uh, wife, Joy, walked down the aisle. And it was on that day that we said our vows to one another and pledged to be faithful to one another for life. Probably use the same verse that you used. 1 Corinthians 13, you know, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You know, now these three abide, uh, endure faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Yeah, we used it too. You know, that, that verse that everybody seems to use because we knew. We wanted to start our, our marriage here because we knew that we were really in love, but we knew that marriage is going to be more like a roller coaster and there's going to be ups in life and there's going to be downs in life and we were going to do this together but we knew we needed a foundation for our marriage and that's why we started our marriage here and it was that day that her pastor, Pastor Rushke and my father talked to us, put their hands upon us, blessed us and we started our marriage life together. Well, I went off to the seminary because I believed that God was calling me to be a pastor. I mean, it's just the same thing that you did. I don't know what you did, but you looked at, at the abilities that you had. You looked at the opportunities that were in front of you, the doors that would open, and you followed through those, the calling that God gave to you. Maybe you went into the military. Perhaps you went to a vocational school or to a college. Uh, maybe you went, just started working in a factory in town or, or, or a business. Perhaps you went on a family farm or a family business that was passed down. I don't know what you all did. But what you did was looking at the opportunities that God had and the abilities that he gave to you. And you moved into those. And through those, that vocation that you had, God provided for you just like he provided for me. And you, he, you had sustenance and he blessed you with many things as you continued into your vocation. For me, it was to be a pastor. And so it was on June 26th of 1977 that I walked down the, the church aisle and I came and again, I knelt at the altar. And again, my father placed his hands on me. It was my ordination Sunday. And he gave me a blessing. And he gave me a Bible verse. And that Bible verse uh, said, said, take heed to yourself and to the whole church, that's you, over which the Holy Spirit has made you an overseer to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. That's you, the ones purchased with his own blood. And so armed with my, the blessings the Bible verses that my father had given to me for guidance for life, I went out into the ministry which God had called me. And what, what a career it was. Starting off in a little dual parish in South Dakota in Oneida and Agar, and then moving a rural farming community, then moving to Marcus, Iowa, another rural farming community at Peace Lutheran Church. And then I went to a, a suburb in, in, of Sioux City, uh, Sergeant Bluff, which young, upward, mobile people, lots of kids, dynamic things going on in the community and in the church. And then I went to Des Moines, Iowa, very interesting ministry there with, with a Sudanese congregation and a Laotian congregation all together with my congregation. I supervised those two pastors and a vicar. And then we had campus ministry with Drake University. And at the same time, 22 of those years, I was also serving as a reserve chaplain for the United States Navy. What a career I had. Wonderful people just like you. People that I worked with, elders and trustees and, and teachers and all the, all the ingredients that are necessary to make a church work and to operate. People who have vocations outside but continue want to serve God inside. I retired in 2014 
And then God called me to a very special ministry six months later, and that was with Lutheran Family Service. And I've been working with them for six years now. But I have to tell you something. I wasn't a perfect pastor. And although God blessed me with three children and five grandchildren that I now have, I wasn't a perfect father. And he blessed me with a very faithful, good wife who's been at my side for 48 years has served as my secretary at times in small congregations, the mother of my children, always there for me. I haven't always been a perfect husband. And yet in all of those times, I knew that he was there to pick me up and that I could come and Sunday after Sunday I could speak the words to the people in my church, but I was also speaking them to myself, even as we speak them to you. As a called and ordained servant of the word. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I could walk knowing that even though I was not perfect, he is, and he forgives those times. <laughs> the front rows of the church. I have such fond memories of the front two rows of the church, right in front of the pulpit. See, in Mallard, Iowa, in the uh, mid-60s, uh, all the little junior high boys uh, sat in the front two rows. We had to take sermon notes for, uh, for our uh, confirmation, and, you know, 100 words we had to have. And so we told our parents, you know, if we sit right in the front two rows, we don't have to look around, you know, the heads of those taller people who were in front of us. And we could see the pastor better and we could take good notes. And what I thought was really incredible thing was our parents bought that line. You know, honestly, we were little boys. We wanted to sit by each other and have fun during church, and so that's what we did. But you know as well as I know who these rows are normally reserved for. These are where the mourners sit. And I've sat in these rows for those reasons too. Following the caskets of my grandparents and aunts and uncles, following the caskets of our fathers and my mother-in-law. But I have to ask you this. Is there any other place you'd rather be at a time like that than a place like this? Where you hear the words of Jesus and the comfort he gives when he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go pre to prepare a place for you, I'll come and receive you unto myself. And to know that your loved one heard those words too. As Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. You probably figured out by now that that story really wasn't about me, was it? And it really wasn't about you. The story was about the rock our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is with us through all our ages and stages of life, way back creating and knitting us together in our mother's womb. As we are born, bringing us into his kingdom through holy baptism, strengthening and nourishing us through the word and through the sacrament, with all the stuff that we face in life, until finally he takes us home to be eternally with him in heaven in the eternal life that he has prepared for all of us. I've got more rocks in my bag. I really don't know what those rocks stand for. But one thing I know, that rock's always going to be there for me. Do you know at Lutheran Family Service, 
That is our mission and ministry. We have a motto that says we walk with others and are there for them just as God was there for us. And so whether it's the young woman who has the unplanned pregnancy or the young couple that's struggling to have a child, the family issues that couples face or families or individuals, the issues that teens have to deal with, with our counseling services, our adoption, our life services, our life advocacy ministries, with our um, congregational services programs that we have, we reach out and we walk with people who are having hard times and we are there for them just as God was there for us. I do want to call your attention to the insert that you received in your bulletins. It talks about our work that we do every day when you support us, what you're supporting. There's an opportunity there for you to, to contribute if you want financially or to get on our mailing list or email list to find out more about what we do in the work that we do. I do encourage you to hand this in today. I find that if people take them home, they tend to put them on a shelf and, and forget about them, but hand them in today. Also, if you don't wish to use them, it gives us the opportunity to recycle them and use them at another uh, congregation or church. But also to go during Bible class today, I'm gonna to be talking about the work that we're doing. Some incredible things are happening. Uh, then God is blessing our work. So come down to Bible class and you'll find out more about that as well. Well, again, I thank you for the opportunity and I thank you for the support that you give to us. And I pray that God continue to bless you in your personal life, in your journey through this life to the life that he has promised to us and your congregation as you reach out into the community with this saving gospel and message of Jesus Christ. For the sake of him who came, who lived and died so that we might live eternally with him. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.